Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Grace Simpkins and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It is also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, where I work, which is located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. NOAA Live webinars will be offered most Wednesdays during the school year at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. And to get more information, you can visit the Woods Hole Sea Grant Education webpage or follow us on Facebook. Now, this series is designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, which, as you know, stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And if you've been participating in our series up until now, I encourage you to send me a photo of yourself during a NOAA Live webinar or wearing your NOAA Live patch. I'm going to put my email in the chat box for that. So if you want to send me a picture, you can. Now, today, it is my pleasure to be introducing you to Casey Cantwell with NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research in Silver Spring. Now, while we'll be talking about Casey's role, <coughs> excuse me, in deep sea exploration, we want to first recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that Casey is coming to us from the land of the Piscataway Conway tribe and the Piscataway Indian Nation. We are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedequina. Now, just a few guidelines before I hand it over to Casey. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line. We want to make sure that everyone can hear Casey. However, the box where you wrote where you're from is where you can write questions. And we encourage you to ask them as we go. I'm going to be keeping track for Casey. She's going to stop every now and then and answer a few questions. We might not get to all of them, but we'll answer as many as we can. Now, this is going to be a great intro to Halloween as we creep into the deep with Casey. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Casey. Thank you, Grace. And hi, everyone, and happy Halloween. Um, so today, I am going to talk to you guys a little bit about all things that go bump in the deep sea, things that are deep and creepy. Um, so as Grace mentioned, I work for NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them in just a second, but I have to say that you are going to always be able to find more information about everything that we talked about on our website, including more videos and more pictures on oceanexplorer.noaa.gov. So if you ever have questions or you're looking to learn a little bit more about anything we talked about, check it out. And I'll also say that as per the NOAA Live tradition, I have included a picture of me when I was in fourth grade uh, and just sort of starting to find my love of the ocean. That's me up there. Okay, so the Office of Ocean Exploration is the only office in the federal government that is dedicated to exploring our largely unknown ocean. We explore the unknown areas and gain data that can help us understand it a little bit better. We also have a really strong commitment to making sure that you folks at home as well as scientists are able to experience ocean exploration for yourselves every day. And that's through our website and through some of the tools that you're gonna see in just a minute. And to learn a little bit more about what our office does and why it's important to explore the ocean, you should check out Onward and Downward, which was a NOAA Live talk given by my colleague, Catalina Martinez, earlier this spring. So my first question that I have for you guys today is what do you think about when you think about the deep sea? So you guys can go and type this into the chat box because I wanna hear from you. Like, What is the first thing that pops into your head when you hear that term? Okay, so this is Grace reporting from the chat box. And like Casey just said, put in that chat box what you think of when you think of the deep sea. And um, as I always say, we have a pretty savvy crew. So we've got Allison who says total darkness and um, Darcy is saying it's in the ocean. Ola is saying discovering unknown species. Pasquale agrees with darkness. Jody uh, thinks of marine animals. Paul thinks of light fish. Amanda thinks of the coral reef and the blobfish, and I have to say the blobfish is such a cool animal. Um, Allison is saying giant squid. Chris thinks of bioluminescence. Jasper thinks big, dark, and spooky. Connor thinks of pressure. Kimberly thinks it's cold, and uh, Abigail says it's dark and cold. So, oh, Rachel says underwater volcanoes. I could go on and on. There are so many great answers, but I'm going to stop there because I think that's a pretty good lit list for you, Casey. 
That's awesome. So you guys totally hit the nail on the head. It is dark. It is deep. It is cold. The deep sea is a lot of places, uh, in a lot of places, is so far remote from us. It's mysterious. A lot of people think of it being big and dark, just like you guys said. So, um, and there's a lot of things that when we ask people this question that we get back that maybe aren't true too. And I'm hoping to kind of change some of those perceptions with you guys today. So while it is dark and cold, it is certainly not lifeless. So to give you guys a little bit of background before we hop into some of the animals in the deep sea, when I talk about the deep sea, I'm talking about waters that are deeper than 200 meters. Or since we are right around Halloween, that's approximately 620 jack-o'-lanterns deep. So if you've carved pumpkins lately and you stacked 620 of them up all together, that's what we'd be talking about, that depth in the ocean. The deep sea is the largest habitat on Earth and it averages about three to four temperatures degrees Celsius. So this is about the same temperature as your freezer, if you think about that in terms of how cold that might be. And then the sea floor, just like we have on land, has canyons and seamounts. So think about the Grand Canyon, or for those of you that are out in Alaska, you know, those big mountains, or in Colorado, the Rockies, we have the same kind of features in the deep sea. They're just called seamounts or submarine canyons. And the deep sea, above all else, is absolutely filled with life. So we're gonna watch this video real quick. And to kind of illustrate that point about, oh, apologies. There, it should be going, it should be quiet. Um, to illustrate the point about how unique the ecosystems are in the deep sea, this is a, a bunch of sponges. So when you think about, when I say the word sponge, a lot of times people think about, you know, their bath sponge um, or the sponge that they use to clean dishes. And while that's true, in the deep sea, sponges look a little bit different. So all of these organisms here are either deep sea corals or deep sea sponges. And they are so uniquely shaped because what they're doing is pulling food down from the water column and filtering it out and eating it. That's why they all have that kind of cone shape or you can kind of see they look like maybe a little barrel or they've got lots and lots of ridges. And that's what helps them as organisms um, capture food. So before I go any further and while this video kind of finishes up, Grace, do we have any questions? This is Grace from the chat box, and I am so glad that you asked, Casey. And I told Casey that we have such a great crew that there are always questions, and I am happy to say that that is still the case. So um, I'm going to ask you the first question Juan asks, and I um, I always love this question. How did you get your job? So um, I fell in love with the ocean when I was a little kid. Uh, about fifth grade, I think, was the first time that I had the term, I want to be a marine scientist. Um, and then I have gone to school. I chose my uh, the college I went to because of their marine science program. I chose the graduate school because of their marine science program because I wanted to work for NOAA from a very young age. I knew that. Um, so it was a lot of math and science classes. And honestly, I had a lot of really cool opportunities that really put me in, in the ocean. Um, and the deep sea job though, I. I kind of fell into and fell in love with it and I haven't left since. It was a convenient job because my husband was starting graduate school nearby, uh, but I definitely got hooked pretty quickly. Great. And we also have a question from Pasquel who asks, why do they look like mushrooms? So is there a reason they're that shape? Oh, I don't know why they would potentially look like mushrooms. My, I can tell you though that the reason that they have that kind of cone shape is, um, I don't know why a mushroom would look similar to them, but um, that cone shape is to help them grab the water in and um, be able to filter it through. Their, their skin is basically able to filter out food for them. So what we see, it's not quite skin, but um, the, the mass that you see of them is gonna be filtering in um, all that food, so filtering the water and taking out the food out of it. Great, and so a couple of questions just again about what we're looking at. Just to, um, Brie is asking, uh, not, I'm sorry, Amy is asking if those are living and Megan is asking if they're sponges, do you know what kind, like what the name of that sponge is? So the majority of these sponges are glass sponges. Yes, they are all alive. 
Um, and each of them, so I'm just gonna click on this video just one more second so you can see it for two seconds. Pretty much every organism that you see there that has a different shape, they're all gonna have a very different name. The majority of them are gonna be what we call glass sponges um, or hexaxonelidid is what the science term for it is. But the, um, there are some corals in there as well. So like this one's a coral and this one's a coral and that little guy too, but they all have individual names. This is a very diverse community, very dense, which means there's lots of organisms in a small area and very diverse, meaning that there's lots and lots of different kinds of animals in one small area. Great. I'm going to ask you one more question. There are a few more questions okay. about um, the video, but I, I always love to ask at the beginning some questions about you. And Miss, and I apologize for pronouncing this incorrectly, but Miss High Race class is wondering how long you've been doing your job and, and what keeps you interested in it? So I started in OER in 2012, so I'm going on my eighth year. And what keeps me interested in my job is that every day is a little bit different. Every day we get to tackle new problems and we get to do new things. And I absolutely love that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that. I'm going to hold on to the rest of the questions because I know you have a lot of really interesting things to show us. So please continue on, Casey. OK. All right. So um, a lot of the slides and the images and the videos that I'm going to be showing you today um, come from my office's program or my office's um, operations on board NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer. Um, there are a lot of NOAA vessels that are out there that conduct research, but we're the only one that conducts exploration in the way that we do. And we usually, um, when during a normal year when we're out and operating, we stream everything that we do live to you on shore so you can engage with us the same way that we're engaging now, which is always really exciting. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about the Okeanos Explorer, there was a NOAA Live webinar by Commander Litter, Litter, Little, Commander, Commander Little, um, where he took you on a tour of the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer and you can learn a little bit more about the ship and its mission uh, and kind of walk through all the mission spaces on that tour. And so some of the things that we're going to be showing you today are um, come directly from our two robots that we use to explore the deep sea. It's only one of the tools that we use, but it's the one that we're gonna see most of the imagery from today. So that's why I'm showing you them. So this big one here is ROV Deep Discoverer. And he's about nine feet tall. Um, and then we have Sirius and they work as a pair. So at any point in time, we'll have them both deployed together and Sirio sits a little bit above Deep Discover and they go wherever they go together as a pair unit together. So Deep 2 sits and looks right at all the cool animals and Sirio provides additional information to our science team about what's going on around Deep 2. So there's perspective and there's sort of guidance from Sirio to help D2 maneuver around the seafloor make sure that we get to see all the things that are down there. So when we go out and conduct these expeditions in the deep sea, we're always looking for information about what's down there. But one of the things that's kind of unique about when we're exploring is that we get the chance to go places that people haven't been before and we get to see things that people haven't seen. So a lot of times, and a lot of some of the things that you'll see today, we get to look at predation events or where something is eating, one animal is eating another animal. And while these are not necessarily rare events, they are still rarely observed because it's so hard to get to the deep sea and it's so we spend so little time there that we don't get to see these predation events that often. So like the video that's playing right now, this is a king crab. Uh, for those of you that like crab legs, this is a related type of animal. Um, and this crab is eating a brittle star, which is a type of sea star. And the entire time that we were filming this interaction, the science team was going, oh no, that's not happening. Oh, that's gotta be one, like, oh, this, this can't be what's happening. They don't eat that, that's not what's happening. And it took us sitting there watching this for about 45 minutes to actually be like, well, we learned something today. This is so unique because we still don't know much about the deep sea. So every time we go out, we usually are recording these rarely seen behaviors. We also are learning more about the important species and where they are located. So we know for any of our commercial fisheries, we learn a little bit more about the habitat and where those animals are located. 
And then we also observe mating pairs in babies a lot. So this is really important for us to learn a little bit about the life history and how an animal grows from a baby up to an adult so that we can learn more about those ecosystems, those environments, and those individual animals. So I have another video for you guys. And while we're watching this video, I'd like you guys to think about what you're seeing and I'd like you to tell me what you see. This video is called, What Just Happened? So this was from the time when we were in just offshore North Carolina uh, in 2016, or sorry, 2018. And you'll get a replay in just a minute, but think about what you see here and how what this might mean for the animals that we're looking at. Okay, so this go was, ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, so uh, whenever you're ready, Grace, I, I could love to hear what folks are seeing. Yeah, so this is Grace from the chat box. And just um, to remind you, so what Casey's asking you to do is write your observations in that chat box so I can share them with her. With her. So Pascal um, said that it looked like that was smoke. So was asking if that was smoke. And um, let's see, what do other people think? What did you observe in that video that Casey just um, sent to you? Juan thinks that it might be an animal um, attacking or trying to catch it to eat. Tatiana thought that maybe that was ink that we saw. Paul says um, a predator. Chris um, saw that the lurking fish erupted out of the sand and ate the other fish. Um, Amanda thought that the blue leg looked like fire. Amy, so Amy thought that maybe the eel was eating the underground fish. And um, let's see, Michelle thought that the fish ate something. So I think there is a little bit of um, a little bit of disagreement about who's eating who in this video. <laughs> but uh, maybe you'll tell us. So I, I'm going to stop there and, and let hand it back to you, Casey. So you guys had some great observation here. So this is a type of fish in the center. So this is an Atlantic midshipman fish, um, and this type of animal is an ambush predator. So this means that they hide and they wait for prey. So what this fish has done is they have buried themselves deep in a sediment, soft sediment environment. So that's what that black smoke looking thing was. It was actually soft sediment and it's black because it doesn't have any oxygen, it's an anoxic sediment. So with that in mind, that's all soft sediment that kind of gets kicked up when the fish moves and when it reaches out and grabs its fish. Um, it's fish, which is what it got, it got eat them. Sorry. When this fish grabs the fish that it ate, which is called a barracudini fish, it was a midwater fish. So it was really interesting about this for our science team was that we were learning more about how the water column life interacts with the set of the um, benthic life or the things that live on the seafloor because the, um, those animals don't usually interact that often. So we were learning more about that process. So when one eats the other, we say, oh, well, maybe maybe that happens more frequently than others than we might have thought beforehand. OK, so one of the next things I want to share with you guys, um, this is an animal called a rhino chimera. So uh, this me personally being a big fan of Disney, I always see this animal and immediately think of zero from the nightmare before Christmas. Um, and these are really wonderful, exciting animals in the deep sea. We always get so excited when we see them. Um, they are a fish that's related to sharks and rays, but they're called a chimera because of, as you see in the video, their lateral line or their sensory organs kind of make them look like the fish has been stitched together, kind of like Frankenstein. So it comes from a Greek word um, for like a, a monster. And so they have, um, they're really quite sweet, and cool looking, but uh, they have that sort of monster monster name. At the top of the animal, there's usually this really tall um, dorsal fin, which you saw in both the video and on this animal here. And that usually has a mildly venomous spine in it. And for the rhino chimera, so you saw a regular chimera and a rhino chimera. Rhino means nose. And so what you have here, this long snout, is um, filled with lots of nerve endings. So this helps the animal see their environment 
in a different way so they can kind of perceive what's going on around them. Um, and those nerve endings are what helps them be able to find food uh, in, in their environment. So they're some of the adaptations that this animal has to living in the deep sea. Those big eyes that you see in both of the video as well as in the picture are also things that are adaptations that this animal has because they live in such a low light environment they have to be able to see any sort of bioluminescence that might be coming off from one of their potential food. They want to be able to see that, so they have these big, big eyes. Okay, um, so I'm going to do one more animal and then I'll stop for questions. So if you guys want to start top, typing in your questions, um, I'll get to them in just a second. So uh, the next animal I have for you guys is Casper. So this is a, a moniker or a name that we gave to this little octopus. This was a new species of octopus um, that we found in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument in 2016. Uh, you may be familiar with this octopus because it was worldwide news for a couple weeks uh, because it just looked so much like Casper the Friendly Ghost. Um, the other thing that we were really excited about, besides just how adorable it was, was that it was a new depth record for this type of octopus. So normally in the deep sea, we see one type of octopus and we don't, when we're really deep like this one was, we don't see this type of octopus. So that was really cool for scientists. And it show, just shows you that there's so much out there from exploration that we're still learning. Every time we go out, we find new things. And that's part of what makes me really excited about my job. So Grace, I have some time for questions. Excellent. This is Grace from the chat box. So let's see, I'm going to lump um, Allison and Kristen together because their question is so similar. And they ask, what is your favorite animal that you found? Or what's the coolest animal you've seen? Oh, Casper is pretty much up there. I'd say actually, I've, I got, I was very fortunate that in this talk, I get to cover pretty much all of my favorite animals that we found. So I'll let the talk talk for itself. Okay, and, and we have um, someone, asked, so I'm gonna answer this question because, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Someone was asking where this new species was found and you found it um, off the coast of Hawaii. Is that correct? Yep, the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Um, so there's a marine national monument there, Papahanao Amokuakea Marine National Monument, and this is the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. So beyond the main islands of Hawaii, there's an another chain of islands that go up um, for several hundred more miles. And this and guy was located there. Yeah, and if you want to know more about that, we actually had someone from the monument, we had someone from um, there on one of our previous webinars. You can you can check that out during our Hawaii week. Okay, so in honor of Halloween, though, Rachel wants to know, what is the strangest or scariest creature that you have ever seen during exploration? This is from Eleonora, sorry. Oh, okay, so uh, I would say the strangest thing I've ever seen were some of these predation events. Um, the crab was probably one of the stranger ones um, that I showed you guys just before because a it just really blew our minds that a crab would eat a brittle star. We didn't think there was much there for it to eat. So it'd be like taking a chicken bone and eating just the bone. Um, we thought that was really strange. Um, that was probably one that we, we sat around for two or three days afterwards, still puzzling about that. It was so odd. Great, and just to go back one second, because someone asked about the sponges, if those are the same kind of sponges that we use in our house. They're not the same, they're closely related, but they're not the same. Um, those ones that we have in the deep sea, as I said, are glass sponges, and that's because their spicules, which give them the name, are actually very, very thin and sharp. So you would not want to use those on your hand. We actually use gloves anytime we touch them to protect our hands from getting um, uh, similar like fiberglass burn um, or rope burn um, from touching them. Okay, one last question. Katya is wondering, how many animals have you discovered in the past month? In the past month, we haven't discovered many because our ship is currently headed in for repairs for the winter. So we haven't had many new discoveries this month. But what's really cool about science is that there's kind of a delay from the time that we collect information to the time that 
people actually publish on it and we can say, guarantee you that this is a new species. It takes a little bit of time for scientists to do the research and to do their homework and get all that information together. So there's been, um, even though during COVID, we haven't been doing much of our normal operations, there have been dozens of papers that have come out from our work in the past because scientists are constantly working up that old data and making sure that we get all, we get to basically wring out all the discoveries from every bit of data that we collect. Great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it back to you um, because I know you have more to show us. Okay, and one last thing about Casper that I forgot to say is that we think that this translucent body uh, which kind of gives it that ghostly appearance, is going to help this small octopus hide from predators. So that's part of its adapt adaptation to its environment and to making sure that it stays safe for, for the time that it's on the seafloor. So I have another video for you guys. Um, and as we're watching this video, I want you to think about what you see and what your observations are about this animal and how it might impact its environment. So Grace, when you're ready, Love to hear what folks think. Okay, this is Grace from the chat box. I think you might recognize this creature from um, the when you signed up for the webinar and we were advertising it. And what do you think? Right, Nolan thinks it looks like a snake. What else do people? Oh, Paul thinks maybe it's some kind of eel. Um, so not only what do you think it is, but what observations, what do you see, like what features or parts of its body, just what do you observe about that? Jody says, lots of rows of teeth. Isabella thinks it kind of looks like it's dead. Christy thinks it's um, really long. Pasquale um, thinks that, I'm not, actually, I'm not quite sure what that says. Um, Chris thinks it looks like an ambush predator with the big toothed mouth. Tatiana sees big eyes. Um, Ola sees pectoral fins that seem to be elongated to move across the bottom. Amanda thinks the head looks a little bit like a skull. And um, Kristen thinks it looks like a bottom feeder or a barracuda. Yeah, so people are noticing that it's got shiny skin, it's got big teeth, it's got big eyes. So I'm gonna hand it back to you. You guys are spot on. So um, some of the things that are distinctive about this type of fish, this is a lizard fish or a bathysaurus. Um, and when I, whenever I see this one, I always think of dinosaurs. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, it's even in the name, bathysaurus. But um, what's really cool about these guys is they have some features in them uh, amongst the group of this fish. So they come in all different colors and different shapes and sizes. But they always have these big eyes that help them see their prey. They always have these very distinctive teeth, which are kind of thin and long and needle-like to help them with eating their prey. And they are ambush predators. I think someone pointed that out in the chat. And they just basically are hanging out on the seafloor most of the time waiting. And they kind of are always sitting there just very calmly waiting for their next meal. And a really fun fact about this whole group of organisms is that they're hermaphrodites, which means that they're both male and female, which scientists think is because they live in isolated environments and there's so few individuals um, that are around the deep sea that they have to be both male and female in order to um, be able to continue their species and be able to have babies. So I have another video for you guys, uh, and this one we will actually hear the sound for. Um, this is, you're just going to give me two seconds here um, in order to show it. So this is all about the water column. So the water column is the largest habitat on earth. And I'm really excited for you guys to see these things because they're pretty much the closest things I've ever seen to aliens. Between the surface of the ocean and the sea floor lies the largest habitat on Earth, the water column. This vast open space includes 95 to 99% of the total livable volume on Earth and is home to a menagerie of animals 
that captivate the imagination these things are just awesome. this is the kind of deep sea biology that really got me hooked on oceanography as a kid beautiful the twilight zone a region of the water column where the last bits of sunlight give way to total darkness is home to many such organisms. Oh, oh, who's that? Wow. Every night, many of the animals that live here take part in the largest migration on the planet, swimming from the depths of the ocean to the surface to feed before descending once again. With this migration, these animals move organic matter from the ocean's surface waters to greater depths, where it eventually falls to the seafloor. Providing a vital food resource in an environment where meals are scarce. Despite its importance to all life in the ocean, the water column is one of the least explored habitats on the planet. Using innovative exploration tools, the NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration and Research is closing the gap in understanding this mysterious world and its inhabitants. Are you guys Casey, able to see my screen again? We are still, uh, we are seeing your slides. Yep. And while okay. you're um, queuing up the slide, I just wanted to, this is Grace from the chat box. Just ask you, um, Eleonora thought it looked like a pirate ship in the water. So I thought you could just tell them what that was that they were, the, um, the vehicle they were seeing. Yep. So what you guys were seeing um, is our vehicles, our two robots. So that was deep discover that you were looking at kind of coasting over the seafloor as it explored the water column. So that's D2 or deep discover, one of our robots. And the bright light that you saw was actually from Sirius. If you guys remember, I talked about how Sirius provides guidance and kind of sits above D2. That's exactly why. So it kind of lights up the seafloor for D2 to explore. And when we're in the water column, it's even more important because you don't have a, the seafloor to kind of give you a sense of place for how deep you are or what up, what's up ahead. And so that's really important to have that two-bodied system when we're working those areas. Okay, so to give you guys a little bit more information about some of the animals that you saw, as I said, they are all very foreign looking. They were the closest things we have on Earth to aliens. Um, so one of the things that you saw a couple, ver a couple species of, they were siphonophores. So siphonophores may look like one big organism that's kind of gelatinous and kind of looks like it's jelly with some stuff inside of it, but they're actually a whole colony of organisms. So throughout a siphonophore, so as you look at each area, you can kind of say there's one here and one here and one here. And so all of these are actually individuals and they work together as a group. So each one of those individuals though will be specialized for things like swimming or feeding or reproducing just depends on where you're looking on a siphonophore, which area might be specialized for which thing. And sometimes on a siphonophore, it'll look pretty uniform like this one. And sometimes they're gonna look really, really different. And it's kind of hard to believe that they're only one, one individual or that it's still from the same exact type of animal. So one of the things since we are talking about Halloween and monsters, um, there are in the water column um, two types of animals in this picture. Uh, so one is very similar to the siphonophores and those are called salps. They're another gelatinous animal. Um, but here you can see some amphipods, which are very similar to the bugs that we have on earth, um, sorry, on land. 
um, and they're actually eating the insides of this salad here. And another thing that you guys saw in um, that video are jellyfish. So a lot of you might be familiar with jellyfish already, but in the deep sea, um, we see them a lot when we're doing water column exploration. This one here um, was really exciting for our team because it is usually a more shallow animal that we saw very deep offshore of North Carolina one year. And that's really cool for us because we can then get to learn a little bit again about how the shallow waters are connected to the deep sea. Um, and for those of you that are just sort of learning about jellyfish for the first time, you can learn a little bit more about them in Mike Ford's uh, NOAA Live Talk, uh, where he talked about jellyfish and all things gelatinous. So another favorite of um, our water column explorers are angler fish. So I said before that I'm a big Disney fan. So for those of you that have seen Finding Nemo, you may recognize this fish. So um, angler fish are pretty uniquely adapted to excelling at life in the deep sea. So they have these little lures, and you can see that in both the image and in the video, where they've got a little tiny, uh, little like a like a sack almost, of bioluminescent bacteria that in the dark environment they glow and that attracts prey to them and then since as i said they are so adapted to live in this environment they have these big eyes so they can see pre prey coming and then you've got um these big jaws that are upward facing both their eyes and their mouth look right up at that lure just waiting for prey to come so that they can snatch it out of the water column so I have another question for you guys. What does this animal remind you of? Okay, this is Grace from the chat box. So go ahead and write in, what do you think this animal reminds you of? And while you're writing that in, I have to tell you, I've told Casey, but the anglerfish is by far my favorite. So, so glad they had what I think of as the starring role in this talk. Um, all right, so let's see. Amy says that it reminds her of a spider. Um, what else is it? Oh, let me see. We've got a couple of other answers. A lot of spiders, right? Paul and Allison and Ola and Juan and Kristen and Connor and Pasquale and Tegan, they all say spider. Jasper says crab. Um, Chris says surgical tubing. They're the creepiest thing in the deep sea. Um, Texas says a crab. Eve says a daddy long legs. And uh, yeah, we've got um, a couple more spiders. And I'm gonna hand it back to you. Oh, a couple and a couple of shrimp. So we've okay. got some shrimp as well. I'll hand it back to you. So this is a sea spider. So you guys were right on. But the difference here is that this is not a true spider. So while it is in a bigger group, very similar to spiders, those are called um, arthropods, or it's very similar to all the bugs that we have on land. These are not arachnids or what true spiders are, but they're pretty similar. Um, so they come in a range of sizes. They can be smaller than an inch to over two feet. Um, and the deep sea, we a lot of times see these big ones. And they use its proboscis, which is what is highlighted here, to slurp up their food. So a lot of times they will live on things like coral, like you see in this image here, where um, they basically go up to a small coral polyp, which is an individual, um, like one of these here, and they'll just go and just slurp it right out of its, uh, right out of that, its home, and they'll eat that. Pretty interesting adaptation. And if you want to learn more about sea spiders, uh, this morning our team on our oceanexplorer.noaa.gov website launched a new fact about sea spiders. And there's a video and a little bit more information there. So if you're interested and I've piqued your interest, go check it out. Okay, so before I start my next video, uh, do we have any questions? This is Grace from the chat box. And what a silly question, Casey. Of course we have more questions. We have a awesome inquisitive bunch of students here. So first of all, we're going to just um, ask a few questions about age because Katya would like to know how long a sea spider can live. And Paul has the same question about the Bathysaurus. I don't actually know for either of them. 
So I'd encourage you guys to do a little bit of research and I'm sure you could find that from some um, web posts that are online about those animals. I'm not an expert in either of them, unfortunately. Um, but what we do see in the deep sea a lot of times is that animals live for a long time because it's so cold, they get really, really big and they live for quite a long time as a whole. Now, I don't know exactly for those animals though. Okay, and so we have, a, um, we have a, Juan's been asking questions, um, the same question about a couple of different species, and that's how do they reproduce or give birth or lay eggs? I think because you did mention um, earlier that one of the species was a hermaphrodite. Is that pretty common or how do they reproduce? So I would say it is kind of a mixed bag. You will have some of the animals that we see in the deep sea, like deep sea corals, they will actually spawn so they'll have they'll release all of their um their eggs and their sperm into the ocean or the equivalent for them into the ocean and eventually they'll meet up um, and they'll develop into a larvae and the larvae will kind of travel around the water for a long time and then settle out somewhere and will start growing its own new colonies animals that live in the water column have some different depending on what type of animal have very different types of reproduction strategies. Some will lay eggs, some will um, do the same kind of broadcast spawning. Um, octopuses are one that's really interesting. A lot of times they'll lay their eggs and then the mom will kind of um, guard them for a long time, very similar to, um, we think of birds nesting over um, or building a nest and kind of hovering over their, their eggs for a long time to keep them warm. Octopuses do something very similar. So it really just depends on what species and there are so many different strategies depending on how many of an, of an organism they are, how frequently they get to see each other uh, and then potentially get to interact with each other. So it just depends. Well, great, yeah. Um... Really interesting. And Ola is wondering, do you, when you're studying these animals, do you dive in a submersible or are you watching remotely for your job? So for my job, a lot of times what, I, what I'm doing is I'm on the ship and the ship is tethered to our robots that are down there. And those vehicles are the ones that are exploring and we don't actually have people on board. So they're uncrewed, but we control them from our control room on board the ship. So most of my time I get to spend sticking my face up against a uh, 60 inch TV and being like, oh, what's that, what's that, what's that? Um, so it's a pretty exciting time. Great, well, we have more questions, but I'm gonna hold on to them because I know you have some fun things to show us. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Okay, so as the, uh, the title of this slide said, parasites are creepy at every depth. So um, this is probably, uh, someone asked before what the most fascinating thing I've ever seen was, I'd say, I said, and I said the, um, the crab before, but this is probably the second most fascinating slash creepy thing I've ever seen in the deep sea. So what you're looking at right now is a shrimp. Um, this is a nematocarcinus shrimp. Um, and the sort of egg looking thing coming from its stomach is actually a parasitic barnacle called a rhizocephalon, which is a very, very long word that took me more than a day to learn how to pronounce correctly. Um, and what's so creepy about this here is that this parasite finds its host and it basically starts taking over control of the host, which I find to be so, so creepy. Besides just like when you look at it, seeing all those red veins, that looks creepy to me, but also um, just the idea that a parasite would join the shrimp and then start taking over control of it just creeps me out. And there are a lot of parasites in all of the ocean that have similar strategies, but it just, in this case, we were very lucky to see this. This was the first observation of this type of parasite on this type of shrimp. Um, so it was a pretty exciting find for us. All right, and the last video I have for you guys is, um, we talked a little bit before about aliens in the water column. Well, those are definitely one interesting type of life, but one of the things that has really changed our understanding of life on Earth was the discovery of hydrothermal vents in the 1970s. So instead of being based on light, like so much of life on Earth is, 
ecosystems that live around hydrothermal vents are actually based on the chemicals that are coming out of these hydrothermal vents. So you see here, there's a bunch of what looks fuzzy. Those are bacteria and you see shrimp and fish and crabs here that are all eating that bacteria. So and there's a mussel there. Um, they're very similar organisms to what we have elsewhere in the ocean. But here, instead of relying on light or things that come down from the surface of the ocean, they're basically living off of chemicals, which was so unique and such a game-changing discovery that happened um, not too long ago. So uh, that's always one of my favorite things to end on, um, really just to highlight, you know, there's so much about the ocean that we don't know and that we are still learning. Um, and I hope that someday some of you will end up joining us and become ocean explorers. And with that, Grace, I'm done. I'm happy to take some more questions. Excellent. Well, this I'm going to actually put my video back up. This is Grace from the chat box, but I will um, show myself again. How are you all? So I just want to tell you a lot of questions did come in. I'm going to share a few more, but we're not going to be able to get to all of them. So Casey so kindly put up this ocean explorer at noaa.gov. If you have questions, you can also send any questions that you still have to me, Grace Simpkins, and we will try to get all your questions answered. Um, okay, so we have a few more questions for you. Um, just one or two, because we are running right, we are out of time, but I, I always like to end with a few questions. Um, so let's see. One question that uh, a couple of people are asking, um, Tegan and Nolan, so when the host dies, did the parasite die, that parasitic barnacle you showed us? Uh, usually, yes, that's what happens. So the host dies and the parasite whose main goal is to basically infect the host and reproduce and get its babies out into the world so that it can, their babies can find new hosts. So usually that ends up happening. Um, that's a big generalization, but that's usually what ends up happening. Okay, and I have to ask this because Megan's asked a couple of times, I'm sorry, Megan, what does Casper eat? I don't know. Okay, so <laughs> I just really don't know, and Casper was a new species, so um, I'm sure that there are some guesses out there, but given that it was a new species that we just found in 2016, we may not know for sure. Yep. So I encourage you, Megan, to look up other um, jellyfish or other and other octopus and other any of the creatures we saw if you want to know sort of what their diet is or their age or anything like that. And um, for Casper, you might not be able to find out, but you might be able to find out for some of the ones we've, we've known for longer. Um, all right, I, um, I see there are more questions, but I also see that we're out of time. So Casey, you have just done such a wonderful job of uh, getting us ready for Halloween. I know I feel prepared. And in fact, I have a lot of ideas for costumes for next year <laughs> or this year if I had, if I have time, but we saw so many really interesting creatures from the deep. So um, if you want those videos, um, some of them will be listed under our resources. We put a lot of resources because um, the group that Casey works for has done so many amazing um, videos and photos. So take a look at all the resources that we have on the Nowhere Live website as well. And I encourage everyone next week, we um, there will not be an Alaska Noah Live on Tuesday because it's election day. But on Wednesday, we're going to be learning all about oysters and how they reproduce. And they're really interesting how they act like vacuum cleaners in the water. So I encourage you to join us for oysters next week. Um, and having said that, thank you to our American Sign Language interpreters, Trisha and Crystal. We're appreciative of having you. Casey, thank you for being a guest on NOAA Live. So glad to have you. And um, for our viewers, see you next week. Happy Halloween, everyone.